Welcome to This Old Camera. I'm your host, Azrael Knight, and today I'm showing you the Kodak Disc series of cameras. Kodak announces a whole new way to make pictures. Introducing Disc Photography. The beginning is this, a unique film disc. A disc so thin there's room in the camera for an array of precision electronics. The new Kodak Disc Camera. Kodak Disc Film was introduced in May of 1982 and included the release of a series of Kodak Disc Cameras including the 2000, 4000, 6000 and 8000. Each had its incremental upgrades like a self-timer and a programmable clock. The 4000, 6000 and 8000 were 67, 89 and 142, 95 respectively. Adjusting for inflation, the 8000 would be 377 US dollars in 2017. Most if not all of these were single button, no frills cameras designed to be pocket sized and marketed to the consumer. It's easy to load and has the technology to do everything for you. You think pictures, it thinks of everything else. No need to focus. Automatic exposure. Automatic flash whenever needed. And automatic wind on. Easy loading, easy shooting, and a compact design was Kodak's aim. They typically had a 12.5 millimeter lens with a max aperture of f2.8 and only shot on two settings. With the flash at f6 at 1 over 200, or without the flash at f2.8 at 1 over 100. The film technology developed for the disc cameras allowed for some additional latitude. And that's what they were really selling here was the film. Kodak had spent at least five years researching and developing this special film. The cassette, or disc as they called it, was able to take 15 8x10 millimeter frames on a 24 degree rotation upright in the camera. It had a base made of Estar, which is a thick polyester usually reserved for their large format negatives. This allowed the film to remain stiff while upright. Additional time was spent improving the chemical process as well, allowing for sharper images and greater latitude. This was known as the HR line of films. Kodakolor HR film could be overexposed by three f-stops or underexposed by two. Even though third-party companies made their own cameras and disc film, it didn't seem to stray too much from the one-button, easy-to-use format. On its release in 1982, George Ashton, technical director at Patterson said, It's great that at last Eastman Kodak is promoting a system for amateur photographers that concentrates on quality and not convenience. Kodak promoted the ever-living heck out of this. They had celebrities, athletes, and even professional photographers endorse it. It was promoted in English. See, I just took two pictures of the cameraman and I don't even know him. German. And Japanese markets, just to name a few. Un disco de película bien delgado que deja espacio para una electrónica computarizada. Not to mention Christmas. Kodak disc cameras make great Christmas gifts because they're so easy to use. It's self-explanatory. Santa's on his way in his merry old sleigh, bringing everyone a Kodak disc. See more great scenes like these in Santa Claus the Movie. Here's one of the last commercials I could find, released in 1987, promoting the Kodak Teledisc. Fans, the new Kodak Teledisc camera with telephoto lens gives you great regular shots or gets you as close as this. Even with all this innovative technology and the incessant or cause we'll get you with the Teledisc. I'm gonna get you the Kodak Disc. I'm gonna get you with the Kodak Disc. I'm gonna get you with the Kodak Disc. I'm gonna get you a Kodak Disc. The film format and the cameras supporting it were a failure, almost from its launch. If you don't believe me, listen to what Larry Madison, senior vice president of Kodak said in this documentary, Kodak, From Blue Chip to Bankrupt. In 1983, we introduced uh, several major products and uh, the large one in the consumer area was the disc camera. And it was a very significant investment for the company. And after, and that was introduced in 1982, but by the end of 1983, it was clear that was going to not be a success. So if the senior VP of Kodak had no faith in this by 1983, why did it take another 16 years to pull the plug on this? And what eventually killed disc film? There are a lot of theories here, and we also have the advantage of another 18 years of hindsight. The easiest point to attack is image quality. 
Here's a frame size from Kodak disc compared to 35 millimeter. This means that anything larger than a 5x7 was noticeably poor in quality, even to the average consumer. Grain was also an issue. Not just because of the frame size, but because the format sometimes relied heavily on film latitude to correct for anything the two-setting camera couldn't handle. Kodak tried combating this by switching to T-grain, but with little success. Image quality already took a hit right from conception, but it took its second hit at the developing lab. The negatives required a special six element lens to make prints, but many of the labs still used a standard three element lens. On top of that, the developing process was not automated, forcing many labs to develop manually. So even if it was a major success, I'm not sure that the labs would be able to keep up with the process. From here, we'll go over some operation basics. Then I'll take it out for a field test. And finally, I'll let you know where you can get one, how much it'll set you back and if it's worth it. So for this example, I'm going to use a Kodak Disc 6000. To load a disc, lift this lever and the back panel should spring open. Place the disc film inside, label facing out and close. Open the front panel to ready the camera. Choose between one of two shooting modes, landscape or portrait. Portrait will slide a close-up filter into place. To fire, just press the shutter button, the only button on this camera. Once your images have been exposed or anytime you're done, you can eject the disc by lifting the same lever. Okay, I'm about to take my camera out for a field test. And I gotta tell you, it was a long road to get here. I am now the proud owner of not one, not two, but eight Kodak disc cameras. Just about every single one of them had an issue, except for this one. I think this one's my best bet. It's a Kodak Telechallenger. It seemed to advance okay, and it takes AA batteries. Overall, this is my most reliable choice, but it's still no guarantee. Okay, before I head out, I need to make sure that everything's still working from last time I checked. As I mentioned, this takes two AA batteries. This pack of disc film expired in 1998. I'm going to snap a couple random shots to make sure it advances properly, then I'm going to head out. Okay, definitely a good sign. I took two shots and I'm now on frame three. I'm going to head out now and make the rest of these photos. Okay, I'm downtown and I'm ready to take some photos. I'm not incredibly confident in this camera. Even if the camera works, the film might not. Um, so I'm not going to be putting a ton of effort into these images again. And this is basically a test roll or in this case, a test disc. Okay, I've taken all my shots and I'm ready to head home and get this thing developed. Okay guys, I'm back home now, I'm in the dark room, and I'm ready to develop this disc film. I've got no idea if these shots will turn out. If it does fail, I think it'll be the film rather than the camera, um, but I won't know until it's all over.
Okay, moment of truth. I haven't looked yet. I'm not expecting stellar results, but at the very least, there's probably going to be some discoloration. I'm also expecting more grain than usual. I do see images, but I don't know how well they're going to show up in scan. There's just no telling how bad they're going to be until this thing dries. The images are pretty much what I expected. Low res and every speck of dust is a boulder. You can see that they were hard to dry, and the chems absorb differently along the edge of the frame. Still, it does have a certain charm, and the film held up a little better than I had guessed. Let's talk about some pros and cons. Pros. If you haven't guessed it, it's easy to use. It's one of the few dead film formats that's super easy to develop. Just take any standard Patterson tank, place the center column inside without a spool, drop the film in and process as normal. Since the film can't fold in on itself, there's no risk. Models like the 3000 and 6000 came in displayable cases and people kept them, so it's easy to find a model complete in box. Cons. Many of these cameras have not stood the test of time. Like I said, I bought several of these on eBay for review and had issues with almost every single one of them. Also, for a seemingly discreet pocket camera, these are loud. Might be due to the age, but I doubt that they were much quieter in the 1980s. If you're selling one, you really need to make sure that it works, and the only way to do that is to put a disc through it. For one reason among others, a lot of these cameras will not wind without a disc in it. If you do plan to buy one online, make sure it's through somebody with a solid return policy. If you do see one at a flea market or a garage sale, buy it at a display only price, unless it's mint in box. That's all for now. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, stay classic.